Robert M. Price, the Bible Geek here. I may uh, have to pause to sneeze and blow my nose loads of times here. I've got some sort of cold or allergy, something like that. Um, I wanted to let you know that my uh, little book, Blaming Jesus for Jehovah, should be out in a few weeks, I guess. It's still in the final process at Intellectual Press. Um, perhaps a little before that, uh, a big fat book that I collected and edited uh, is coming out and will be on Amazon. It's uh, called The Ground of Being, Neglected Essays of Paul Tillich. Uh, I have an introductory essay and uh, that discusses Tillich and light of deconstruction, stuff like that. And uh, th better than that is Thomas J. J. Altizer's preface. He was a friend and student of Tillich and always has fascinating things to say. I think this book will be about uh, 25 bucks, and uh, again, I'll let you know when it's uh, closer than that to, uh, to realization. Uh, one reason I have uh, not done geeks uh, as uh, often as before is that I'm uh, heavily uh, involved, very uh, hard at work on my book Holy Fable, the chapter on the prophets, uh, and uh, it's coming along real well. I'm happy with it. I still have a good bit to do, and then after that, the wisdom literature and so on and so on. Okay, well, anyway, here's the first one from uh, uh, John Felix. Uh, during the November 14th Bible Geek podcast, a listener asked if there existed a work to align the Strong's Concordance of the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek Bible with the Syriac Peshitta. A good friend of mine, A. Francis Werner, has produced the following work, Aramaic New Testament with Hebrew Strong's uh, Numbers. Uh, Ancient Roots Translinear Bible Book 4. It's a Kindle edition. There is no print edition. The base text is the Peshitta with reference to other ancient texts. In addition, uh, she has also produced other supplementary works, notably the Complete Aramaic Dictionary, Old Testament and New Testament, with Hebrew Strong's numbers, plus Jastro, uh, the great Assyriologist. Uh, uh, this is this PG period. I'm not sure what that abbreviates. Index Kindle only. I hope this helps. So once again, that is um, A. Francis with an E. Um, Werner. And uh, it's Aramaic New Testament with Hebrew Strong's Numbers and um, complete Aramaic dictionary, Old Testament and New Testament with Hebrew Strong's numbers, etc. Thank you, John. I never would have known such things existed. I sure appreciate that. Hey, uh, Jason from Bridgewater, Mass. says, uh, The Gospels are conflicted about the identity of Joseph of Arimathea, and I'm not sure why. Mark says the, quote, whole council put Jesus to death. Mark 14.55, and that Joseph was a prominent member of that council, 15.43. Matthew retains that the whole council put Jesus to death, but he changes Joseph's role into that of a simple rich man who was a disciple of Jesus, Matthew 27.57. Luke alters Mark from the whole council to just the council, put Jesus to death, Luke twenty-two sixty-six, and says that Joseph was on the council, but he didn't consent to the plot against Jesus. Why would Matthew and Luke be so intent on changing Joseph from someone who condemned Jesus to death, though he was looking for the kingdom? Uh, where's my screen? Oh boy, what is going on here? Okay. Um, why would Matthew and Luke be so intent on changing Joseph from someone who condemned Jesus to death, though he was looking for the kingdom, to someone who didn't consent, uh, or to someone who was just a wealthy disciple of Jesus? Was there some kind of jam created by Mark that had to be reconciled, or did it just make for better storytelling? 
Well, I'm tempted to say that you can explain this by the progressive sanctification of Joseph of Arimathea, but that's not really an answer. That simply describes what is happening. Uh, and, uh, excuse me, told you. Um, Something like that, of course, did happen with Pontius Pilate, who uh, was whitewashed already in the Gospels and uh, was then eventually declared a saint in the Ethiopian church. Saint Pontius Pilate. I wonder if there's a Saint Pilate feast day on the calendar. Um, well, um, same thing sort of happened, but there you have the explanation that there was a tendency to uh, push the blame on to Jews to... Um, get the Romans off the hook because early Christians were trying to uh, appease Rome so that they didn't get persecuted. Um, but here, you know, what, why that wouldn't obtain. So I am guessing the um, changes in the treatment of Joseph of Arimathea in Matthew and Luke uh, were attempts to kind of harmonize a, a difficulty in Mark because, uh, though I don't think that, you know, if, if there is any history to this, uh, I don't think there is actually a problem, but one might say, wait, wait a second. Uh, Mark says that he implies that Joseph must have voted for Jesus to be um, crucified, and yet he, he takes care of the body afterward. Why would he do that for a stinking heretic? Uh, well, uh, that does look a little odd, but on the other hand, uh, you have to keep in mind that burial of the dead, especially the dead with nobody else to do the job, was a major uh, good work in ancient Judaism. The whole book of Tobit is based on that. And uh, so uh, it was like, even though he's a Christian, Criminal. He's a fellow Jew, and um, you, you can you can well imagine that he might vote uh, against Jesus reluctantly, thinking it was a tragedy, and then give him a decent burial. Um, that's not absurd. I mean, there's some things that are so inconsistent, you just have to figure, wait a second, we got a real contradiction here. Different sources have been s stitched together, but this doesn't quite fit into that. Uh, it doesn't go that far, but it does cause you to wonder. And uh, Matthew and Luke, I suspect, uh, felt uh, maybe they ought to iron this out a bit. Well, Joseph was a disciple, not a Sanhedrinist. Uh, Luke, well, he was a Sanhedrinist, but he was out getting coffee during the vote or, or uh, protested, but he was the only one or something like that. So I think it's a case of uh, trying to iron that out, not necessarily to vindicate Joseph for his own sake. But then, of course, this would all be thrown into a cocked hat, as they say, if Richard Carrier is right, breaking Arimathea down to meaning something like the beloved disciple, uh, Joseph of best disciple town. Ari, best, like aristocracy, ruled by the best, uh, and uh, uh, Mathetes, disciple. Uh, and uh, if he's right, then, then I guess uh, we've got uh, at the very beginning of the Joseph tradition the notion that uh, he is a disciple of Jesus and a good guy, in which case you really have a problem with Mark. Uh, because he apparently didn't know that anymore and doesn't mind uh, at least leaving the implication that Joseph of Arimathea voted against Jesus. Would he have done that if he were uh, um, a disciple of Jesus? I mean, that's worse than Peter denying Jesus. That's on the level with Judas Iscariot. Uh, and so um, maybe there's maybe somehow... Matthew and Luke know that he's supposed to be a good guy, but he's but Mark has uh, kind of set him up, perhaps un, unwittingly. So that's what I'm guessing is going on there. You know, it's uh, there's a tradition that Joseph of Arimathea was the uncle of Jesus, and that then raises the question that um, well, if he's the he's said to be the uncle, is that analogous to making James and the others the 
cousins of Jesus when it actually says they were brothers? Uh, is it because um, uh, for Christological reasons you don't want Mary to have had other kids? Well, similarly, uh, Joseph might originally have been understood to be Joseph, the father of Jesus. But they sort of didn't like that and figured Joseph's out of the picture. Let's make this guy the uncle, quote unquote, of Jesus. But if he was, it's in some version of this, supposed to be the father of Jesus, then we really have um, a parallel, as uh, Dennis uh, McDonald points out in uh, the Homeric Epics and the Gospel of Mark, to uh, Priam going to Achilles to um, plead for the body of his son, Hector, because in, it's, uh, it would be the same thing. Joseph, the father of Jesus, going to Pilate to request custody of the body of his son, Jesus. Interesting possibilities. I love stuff like that, though. You know, it's just fun speculation. There simply is no way to know. Um, but uh, pretty tempting. Okay, uh, Lachlan Christ, oh, wait, Cristante, Vampire Predator, says, Listening to the dulcet tones of James Earl Jones, reading from the book of Matthew, I puzzle over, But I say unto you, that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek. Turn to him the other also, and use the force. I assume that most people will lash out with their dominant hand, which means most people are going to be hit on their left cheek first. I feel there must be some deep mystery that I'm missing. Uh... Yeah, and maybe not a deep mystery, but there is a pretty good explanation for this, namely that uh, you would use your, um, what is it, your uh, left hand to give a backhanded slap, uh, and that, because that was really insulting. Uh, so that that's presupposed there, and and that sounds very likely to me. So that's uh, if you get a really bad insult, a backhanded slap, uh, it would hit you on the, the uh, right cheek. And uh, then you say, look, um, you, you go ahead and keep playing if you want. You shame the opponent. Uh, let's see, Jay says, how can so many people believe the Bible to be the inspired book of God? Well, of course, they're taught that it is, and uh, they want to believe that it is, that they've got uh, an infallible textbook that assures them of the right doctrine and uh, entitles them to a ticket to heaven. People um, look for answers in an invisible realm, the realm of God, heaven, etc., uh, in order to... Uh, make sense of the three great enigmas of this life, uh, injustice, ignorance, and uh, what else did Geert say? Uh, suffering, injustice, and, uh, and ignorance, I guess they were. That, uh, yeah, why? Uh, just watching the incredible, uh, sh uh, what is it? No, the amazing colossal apostle. <laughs> Get it right, Price. The movie title that I ripped that off from. The Amazing Colossal Man, just watching that last night with Victoria. And the, the guy is exposed to a plutonium bomb and the radiation, instead of killing him, m makes him mutate and grow to uh, like 60 feet eventually. Uh, it's as if Bruce Banner and he, he, this happened because the guy was trying to save a pilot who had crashed uh, on the... Uh, the testing field and um, the 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 bomb going off has been delayed. I mean, by, they don't know when it's going to blow now. And he decides to take the risk to go out and rescue the guy, but kaboom! And he becomes the amazing colossal man. You wonder if Stan Lee happened to catch this because it's like Bruce Banner uh, running out at the last minute to rescue the idiot Rick Jones. Um, this teenager playing his guitar and his hot rod out on the testing field, which he's somehow gotten on to and doesn't realize what's going on. 
And he does manage to uh, get Jones into a trench that uh, saves him, but not before Bruce is uh, inundated with gamma rays. Uh, and, of course, he turns into the Hulk. Uh, but um, it's as if he turned into Giant Man, right? It's, uh, you wonder if Stan uh, had, had the, that in mind, if he did good for him. Okay, so... Um, how the heck did I get onto that? Yeah, uh, there's a scene in which uh, the colossal man's fiance is naturally agonizing over all of this and says, why did it have to happen to him? He was such a good man and so on and so on. Well, we'll never know. Yeah, exactly. The seeming injustice in the world. How can that be if there's a good God running the show? Well, we don't know, but... Um, uh, when we get to heaven, we'll find out, or the famous tapestry analogy. If you look at the back of the tapestry, you're going to see what appears to be a chaos of uh, overlapping threads of different color. What is this? Well, then if you look at the other side, say, oh, oh, it's a nice uh, picture. Well, yeah, we're looking at the underside of the tapestry. When you get to heaven, you'll be able to see the sense it all makes. And that's that kind of thing, right? And whenever anybody says, gee, I got a contradiction of the Bible here, uh, I, uh, but there can't be one, so I guess we'll just have to wait till we get to heaven to go to this big seminar where the angels will be um, saying, you know, I bet you always wondered how um, uh, the heavenly voice said to Jesus both, this is my son and you are my son at the same time. Well, here's the answer you've been waiting for. Uh, so on. Uh, it's like, yeah, we, uh, Clifford Geertz says in uh, his great essay, Religion as a Cultural System of Symbols, that religion gives us symbols and myths to solve those problems in a kind of a spurious way. It's like, well, I don't know who won the Oscar this year, but I know uh, the name is in that sealed envelope. And they, I guess we'll have to wait till the end of the night to find out, or 4 a.m. or whenever the thing's over, to find out um, who got it. Uh, and I think that's what the value of the Bible is, that it is uh, supposedly um, a repository of all of these secrets, or at least uh, promises, to find out the answers. And it, it's the more you read it, the more and study it, the more you realize this uh, it just is not the kind of book we're reading. It just if 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 there was supposed to be such a book, it wouldn't read like this one. Mm, thanks, Jay. Uh, let me get down to the bottom of this one. Uh, Jason Quackenbush he always has good stuff. I'm reading Bart Ehrman's excellent book, Orthodox, The Orthodox Corruption of Scripture, on your recommendation, and it's raised an interesting question for me. Early on, Ehrman argues rather extensively that Luke, in its original state, has an adoptionist Christology, or at least can be read that way. If one accepts that Polycarp of Smyrna was the author, or at least the final redactor, of Luke Acts, as you and others have suggested, and further accept that David Trobish is right and Polycarp is the anthologizer of the first Catholic canon, it seems we should be able to, to deduce some of Polycarp's theology from these various conclusions. Most importantly, it would seem to suggest that Polycarp was some sort of adoptionist, or at least a partisan of the Christology that would soon develop into adoptionism shortly after Polycarp's lifetime. Do you think that's right? I believe adoptionism was a live controversy in the second century uh, after Polycarp Oh, where the heck am I? Why am I losing the screen? Yeah, okay. Um... Mm, uh, let's see, let's see, uh, that would soon develop into adoptionism shortly after Polycarp's lifetime. Do you think that's right? I believe adoptionism was a live controversy in the second century after Polycarp is supposed to have died, but I haven't been able to find anything to suggest it was a concern that was present at the time Polycarp would have been writing. Further, since it is fairly clear that whoever did the work of 
uh, riding Lugax and assembled the cannon was aimed pretty directly at taking on Marcio, and that would make sense because adoptionism doesn't make any sense in the context of a docetic Christ, since if the docetics are right, there's no real human Jesus for the father to adopt, right? I note that apparently Polycarp wrote numerous letters which have not been preserved, and if they were adoptionist in character, that would go some way toward explaining why they had not been preserved by Orthodox scribes. I read the one letter that has been preserved, and it doesn't seem to address this issue at all, uh, so I found little help in settling the question there. What do you think? Am I on to something here? Well, uh, Jason, I, uh, I'm not sure, I don't remember now uh, what uh, Bart said about that, um, but I do know that if you uh, subtract the first couple of chapters of Luke as Consulman, uh, who didn't believe in either Streeter's proto-Luke hypothesis, um, or uh, certainly not the old Tubingen hypothesis revived recently, um, uh, namely that uh, there was an Ur Marcus which uh, either Marcion used or the Marcionites wrote uh, with Marcionite doctrine in mind, whatever. Uh, th that uh, would mean that the nativity story was not originally a part of Luke, right? And without the nativity story, you don't have this view of Jesus being born as a demigod, right? the Holy Spirit, etc., etc. And uh, so the first you would hear uh, of uh, Jesus would be the uh, the baptism, just like in Mark, which appears to be adoptionistic. And uh, in fact, uh, some old Latin manuscripts preserve what I feel pretty sure is the original reading of Luke. Um, direct quote from Psalm number two, you are my son, and instead of saying, uh, in whom I'm well pleased, it said, uh, uh, today I have begotten you. Now that would certainly seem to be um, um, adoptionistic. But remember, uh, Marcion's gospel didn't even have that, right? Uh, it, it starts with Jesus coming down, quote-unquote, to Capernaum, uh, down from heaven with whatever kind of celestial body uh, Jesus had. From what I understand, Marcion wasn't a docetist in the Gnostic sense whereby his body was just sort of a hologram uh, it couldn't even be touched like in the Acts of John you know there were other kinds of docetism the idea that he um, didn't feel any pain on the cross even though he did have a body he only seemed to suffer and so forth so there were different views of that or that Jesus escaped crucifixion and somebody else was uh, put to death in his place, or that it was a phantom on the cross, but not before. These are all various kinds of, of docetism. But if uh, Bart is going along with what Konzelman said, that, um, that the first couple of chapters were not originally part of Luke, then that would leave Luke looking like a docetist. And um, so, yeah, that, that makes some uh, sense to me. Uh, let's see. So I, I don't think personally that you could see Polycarp as a docetist because he's the one that uh, in any case would have added the nativity story to make it look like the gospel grows out of the Old Testament in Judaism. And, uh, and in that nativity, Jesus is uh, born as a demigod, like in Matthew, uh, not uh, adopted later. Uh, so, um, okay, hope that helps. Yeah, that is a great book by Bard. Oh, see, uh, Lachlan again, she says, in Matthew, Jesus sends... Um... I, uh, 
think there's a typo here. Okay, I guess this is a, in Matthew. Jesus sounds pretty chatty, amazing his disciples, scribes and Pharisees, the multitudes, until he is put on trial, where he becomes very elusive and oddly silent. Here's my take on it. There are limits to his power to raise the dead. He really wants to be crucified, as he told his disciples that was his plan, but he finds out that his friend Judas killed himself. Jesus feels guilty and he wants to resurrect Judas. He uses as much of his power to influence people so that Pilate really wants to let him go free, but ultimately things go according to the original plan, except, of course, all of his family telling Peter and Judas that they're going to do certain things. At least James Earl Jones uh, has a very calm and mellow narration for Jesus. Uh... You betrayed me, a Scottish accent requested. You betrayed me, betrayed my trust. You betrayed our friendship. You betrayed everything I've ever stood for. You let me down. Do you think I care for you so little that betraying me would make a difference? I got to admit, I'm not quite sure what you're getting at there. Um. Also, are you asking if the historical Jesus did all this stuff and that he really thought he could raise the dead and so forth uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure maybe you could clarify uh, let's see um, this one from bum, 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 uh, John he says what do we know about the Ebionites my understanding is that they were a first century group of Jewish Christians from Jerusalem who did not believe in the resurrection or the divinity of Jesus. I think they believed in the resurrection, though not the divinity exactly, though that's kind of semantic because they seem to have had this fascinating doctrine of the true prophet who had appeared in the in various patriarchs and prophets throughout Israelite history and had now appeared in his definitive form. He was like re Adam reincarnated, in fact. And uh, so th that he would be you know, the incarnation of some kind of superhuman entity. Uh, but then you also hear that they didn't believe in the virgin birth because they thought that he uh, was the natural son of Joseph. Uh, who knows? Um, it's uh, And then I believe that uh, we're told that some did believe he was uh, virgin born. So this must have been a set of movements or those who tell us about them in the early church were confused. Okay, um, I ask because it seems like a very early sect of Christianity that was from Jerusalem and did not believe in the resurrection. Um, I'm sorry, let me try this again. I ask because it seems like a very early sect of Christianity that was from Jerusalem and did not believe in the resurrection would seem to undermine the apologetic argument that the early belief in the resurrection among the followers of Jesus is strong evidence for the historicity of the resurrection. After all, if a group closest to ground zero did not believe in the resurrection and um, the uh, only relatively early stories we have, Paul and the Gospels, appear to have been written uh, far, from, far away from potential witnesses in Jerusalem, then it would seem like strong evidence for the argument that the stories about Jesus metastasized as proto-Christianity spread away from Jerusalem. And borrowing the A.N. Sherwin White statement that apologists love, uh, he himself was an evangelical, by the way, it would also suggest that even those early legendary developments could not eliminate the solid core of historical truth that the Ebionites believed, if, that is, we can say with any confidence what the Ebionites believed. Uh, so what do we know about the Ebionites and how do they fit into the early Christian traditions? Um... Well, John, I uh, I suspect you're um, confusing their rejection of the virgin birth with a rejection of the resurrection. I uh, I don't remember ever reading that they didn't believe in the resurrection. But what the logic of what you're saying certainly tends to undermine the virgin birth doctrine, right? Because here are Jewish Christians from a very early time that uh, thought that this virgin birth stuff was some kind of pagan admixture, and uh, that uh, that kind of does seem like yeah, it must have been added later. Now. 
some people say that some scholars say that the Ebionites are a later group. Uh, Hans Joachim Sheps, in a great little book called Jewish Christianity, uh, says that uh, he thinks that the cardinal doctrine of the Ebionites, where scripture was concerned, namely that Jesus appeared uh, wanting to set the record straight on what God had actually inspired in the scripture, in the Old Testament, and what um, sneaky scribes had added, very much like Jeremiah 7. God never commanded animal sacrifices in chapter 8 of uh, Jeremiah, the uh, the lying pen of the scribes has falsified the Torah. There's a shocker, I'm telling you. Sorry about this. Uh, and uh, that's just what the Ebionites are said to have believed. And there were also vegetarians, interestingly, and they call themselves the poor. That's what Ebionites means. And the the Jerusalem church is called the poor, and the uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls sect call themselves the poor, which kind of implies they're all the same group. Well, um, uh, let's see. The okay, uh, Shep says that it looks like that this uh, false pericopes theory, as they called it, about the Old Testament was a Jewish-Christian counter to Marcionism. Of course, Marcionite Christianity said that Jesus and Christianity and the Gospel have nothing to do with Judaism of the Old Testament. It's a, the revelation of an entirely un hitherto unknown God and his plan of salvation and so on. And therefore, Marcion said, uh, the Old Testament is the scripture of Jews. It's not our scripture. It doesn't have, they're right. It has nothing to do with predicting Jesus. That's a lot of nonsense. Um, Jesus is revealing a whole new God, etc. Well, you can imagine people that were very Jewish in their Christianity wouldn't like that much. And so, but they did grant the force of some of the objections Marcionites made to the Old Testament. What are you telling me? God wants bloody animal sacrifices, etc., etc. Uh, some of the Jewish Christians said, he, he's got a point there. Uh, I, maybe we ought to sort of compromise and say, yes, that stuff is not from God. Now, the true God, the God of Jesus, is the God of the Old Testament. You Marcionites are wrong about that, but you do have a point. Uh, no God of Jesus could have commanded genocide and sacrifice and that, so he didn't. And in fact, that's what Jesus came in order to do, to... Uh, uh, to root that stuff up out of uh, the Christianity. Well, if that's the case, uh, you do have to wonder if the Ebionites are uh, formed their distinctive identity as a response uh, to Marcionism in the second century. And uh, so that does bring into question if the Ebionites are the a survival of the original Jesus movement. They still might be in any case, but uh, maybe they wouldn't have had the false pericopes theory. But again, as I've already said, that there seem to be different uh, doctrines, rather significant differences, but in in what we're told of the Ebionites, and um, it may well be that uh, there were different groups of them with different uh, views. There were other Jewish Christian groups as well, the Nazareans, the Elkasites, etc. Uh, Jackson Lee says, in a recent online discussion, I was noticing how the descriptions of Jesus' resurrection and post-resurrection appearances become more detailed as you progress through the texts in the chronological order that they were written. From Paul's appearances, quote-unquote, of Jesus, to Mark's empty tomb, to the later Gospels describing conversations with Jesus, uh, people sticking their fingers in Jesus' wounds and so on, I think I have heard many possible theories on the Bible geek as to why later writers would include these details. Um, your discussions about the topic have been fascinating. My questions are about the author of Mark. What do you think Mark believed regarding Jesus' resurrection? No details are provided, but the empty tomb sort of implies a resurrection or at least something strange happening to Jesus' body. If he believed in the resurrection, why wouldn't he include details of it in his gospel? The only reason I could think of would be that... Um, 
Um, oh boy, my screen has vanished again. I don't know what is happening here. Okay. Um, the only reason I can think of would be that possibly Mark was writing for a community whose members held a variety of views about Jesus' nature, and in order not to take sides or alienate parts of the community, he simply left it open as a mystery so that he wouldn't be quashing anyone's views with his gospel. Do you think this is a possible explanation? Well, uh, Mark does appear, or at least his predecessor, if there if there was a prior uh, evangelist who created the messianic secret, a kind of proto Mark, uh, because Mark seems not quite to grasp it and to compromise it a little bit. So it looks like something he's inherited rather than something he invented. But um, th the creation of the messianic secret was a way to try to reconcile different views of. Uh, of Jesus and whether he had been the Messiah all along or only became so at his at his resurrection and so on. So such a motive is certainly not um, something alien to Mark as far as we know. Uh, but uh, it's, um, let's see here, this gets a little tricky. Uh, as Charles Talbert has pointed out, in his great book, What is a Gospel? He says that the story of the empty tomb is so much like a number of apotheosis narratives in the Hellenistic world, where Romulus and Empedocles and um, uh, various figures, uh, Aristeus, the son of Apollo, and, and others, had uh, vanished, Apollonius of Tyana, they'd vanished and been taken up to heaven and this was confirmed by the fact that no one could find the body. Uh, you've got this already in Elijah and Enoch, and even implicitly Moses in the Old Testament. So it was a very widespread sort of a thing. Uh, and uh, you might have a post-ascension appearance to reassure people or to command people, but you might not. And uh, But the point was the the lack of Jesus' body in his tomb would indicate that he has risen up to heaven, to the right hand of God, whether he appears uh, to anybody or not. So, and many New Testament scholars have said for a long time that it looks like originally the ascension and the resurrection were the same thing. Uh, either there weren't any resurrection appearances in the original version, uh, or uh, they were understood to be visions from heaven, like we still see in the book of Acts, uh, when Paul is in Jerusalem, uh, um, uh, and I think in Corinth, Jesus appears to him to encourage him and so forth, but it's not considered a resurrection appearance. Uh, and uh, it's the um, not presented that way in, in Acts. And so uh, it may be that the uh, appearances were supposed to be, again, like Stephen's vision of, of Jesus standing beside the throne uh, in Acts 7 when he's about to die. So uh, Mark could have thought that. Uh, he seems to have expected some reunion of Jesus with the disciples in Galilee, right? He has Jesus predicted at the Last Supper, uh, though it seems to go over everybody's head, and he has the young man at the tomb remind, tell the women to remind Peter and the others to meet him there. Well, Vili Markson um, suggested that that is um, really a prediction of the parousia, that they thought Jesus would immediately return from heaven to wrap up the whole thing, the apocalyptic denouement, but that, uh, of course, the disciples didn't go because the women disobeyed the young man and didn't tell him a thing, which is what it actually says in Mark, right? Uh, so um, that might explain the delay of the parousia. That, that could uh, be an, yet another attempt to deal with that. It would have happened. You know, go to Galilee, there you will see him. Uh, that that would be the, uh, the the parousia, and so there'd be no resurrection appearances except that. In fact, Karl Barth uh, thought that the resurrection of the second coming may originally have been the same thing, uh, and Markson's view sort of uh, makes some sense of that, especially in light of Robert M. Fowler's great book, 
let the reader understand reader response criticism and the gospel of mark where he points out how so many statements of jesus in mark uh, are plainly aimed over at the disciples over the disciples heads directly at the reader sometimes mark tries to rationalize how it is that the disciples didn't seem to hear what jesus said you know, like the passion predictions. Oh, well, what the heck does he mean by that? What does he mean by resurrection? Well, it's pretty clear, isn't it? Jesus seemed to think so, but you're not getting it. Well, that's because he's Jesus is really a literary character speaking to the reader, not to the the disciples, and um, and so by the same token, what um, what Mark would be doing with that stuff you know tell him to go to galilee there you will meet him that this is really the evangelist speaking to the readers predicting that jesus would appear shortly in galilee or that he would have had the women done what they were told uh, so um th those are interesting possibilities now um some have thought that mark in an earlier version of his gospel did have a resurrection scene and an appearance, uh, and I'm sorry, an ascension scene, and that they're still in Mark, but the deck has been reshuffled. That uh, the the um, uh, boy, the confession of Peter scene was originally the resurrection scene and he appeared to Peter after all we read that in 1 Corinthians 15 and in Acts 24 that he appeared to Peter but we don't have any uh, story of that right where uh, he's just appearing to Peter well admittedly uh, the Caesarea Philippi scene in Mark has the others there too but that could be part of the redaction it's really a uh, scene between Peter and Jesus and he says, who do you say that I am? And he says, you are the Christ of God. And uh, that might have been the, uh, because now it's become clear through the resurrection. And um, that could be the resurrection appearance. Uh, then the ascension would be the transfiguration. He goes to a mountaintop and uh, with the disciples, they see Moses and Elijah understood as welcoming him into heaven. And then the Shekinah glory cloud envelops the whole scene. And uh, then they saw no one, but in its present state, it says, but Jesus alone. Bultmann says that was probably an ascension story that they saw him vanish into the cloud. Uh, that uh, makes a lot of sense to me. In fact, I've done a kind of reconstruction of, uh, of uh, Ur Marcus or Proto Mark or whatever that um, I want to uh, publish uh, eventually. It was supposed to be in the pre Nicene, no, no, in the, um, there's an appendix to the human bible new testament but got lost somehow in the editing process but it's uh, it's a, so there like also uh john dominic crossan and helmut kester and others i think believe that um uh, that there was a resurrection scene and other stuff uh, that uh in the original gospel which they identify with secret mark and that it has been sort of censored for the wider Christian reading public, a la Morton Smith. Fascinating possibilities. There's always, it's like an embarrassment of riches. There's so many good possibilities, it's very tough to ever be sure of anything. But that's okay, unless you're a dogmatist who wants to slam his fist on the Bible and say, this is the truth as is. Donovan Willett in Mobile, Alabama. Haven't heard from him in a while. He says, I'm in the process of reading David Fitzgerald's Nailed and came across a couple of things I wouldn't mind hearing your thoughts about. In his section talking about manuscripts, he mentions the Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus as a pair of the oldest full-text Gospels. Could you discuss what these two manuscripts are and how they compare to each other and to more modern Gospels? Let me deal with that one quick. These are both from the 4th century, the 300s, and um, they're on fine vellum. And they're, um, 
uh, the whole New Testament and some of the Old Testament and some extra books like uh, I think First Clement, the Epistle of Barnabas, the Shepherd of Hermas, and so on, which is very interesting because it kind of implies that um, even uh, in in the fourth century the um, canon was not settled. Now was we're told that the Emperor Constantine had 50 fine uh, pulpit Bibles, you might call them, made up and sent out to the various bishops throughout the empire. And some have suggested that these two manuscripts may be two of those. I mean, they certainly date to the right century, anyhow. Uh, and that would be especially interesting because um, he was a patron, Constantine was a patron of Athanasius. Uh, the great bishop um, involved in the Nicene Council and so on, because in 367, uh, Athanasius sent out this encyclical letter uh, telling everybody to use only the 27 books that we still have in our New Testament, uh, no others. And this is why the Nag Hammadi books were hidden away, because they figured, uh-oh, once they got this letter, the, the, the same people are going to come around as enforcers and burn any books that don't appear on this list, so we better hide them. Uh, so uh, there was an attempt in the 4th century to narrow down the canon um, because there had never been an official statement about it. And I think the 27-book canon that Athanasius endorsed w actually stems from the middle of the 2nd century and that Trobish is right, it was Polycarp's edition which had gained great prominence and Athanasius was trying to say, okay, this edition and no other. But uh, then it's doubly interesting that you still have the shepherd of Hermas and, and Barnabas and so on, apparently, as part of the New Testament. Though who knows what the, uh, the editors thought they were doing. Were they giving an appendix or what? Who doesn't really say, though. Um, uh, these were very important manuscripts in the history of textual criticism in the 19th century because once they surfaced, and I believe it was Tregelius who was one of the uh, great critics, he was looking for manuscripts in the Middle East and uh, in the monastery of St. Catherine uh, atop um, what was supposed to be Mount Sinai, uh, he noticed, they, they put him up there, and in his room he noticed there were papers lining the garbage can and that they had writing on them, and it turned out they were manuscript pages from the Codex Sinaiticus. Uh, and he, he recognized the importance of this and went to the ab and said, y you got any more of this stuff? And well, uh, yeah, uh, let's look at the trash bin here. And so there was the whole New Testament, as I say, and some of the old, and this was a major, major... Uh, discovery. I don't happen to remember how Vaticanus was discovered, but it seems to be part of the same edition, you might say. Both of them have earlier readings than, um, than most of the much later manuscripts used hitherto, and this uh, was, I guess, the big impetus behind doing the revised version of the Bible, which evolved into the uh, English revised, well, that was the English revised version. It uh, was slight, in slightly different form. It was published over here shortly thereafter as the American Standard Version, and of course those have morphed into the Revised Standard Version and the New American Standard Bible, all good Bibles. Right? And um, um, so they were very important, uh, and, and it's interesting that you have of course, uh, they're manuscripts, which means they're hand-copied, and there are also scribal corrections to the text, which meant that these ancient guys realized there were different manuscripts and compared them and so forth. We don't have uh, the earlier ones that they had. I mean, we hardly even got these, right? And so uh, we, uh, we don't know if they were right and that these corrected readings come from better manuscripts or whatever, but in any way you cut it, uh, these were, this was a huge step forward in eliminating copyist errors and, and stuff like that. So very, very important manuscripts. Uh, I saw Sinaiticus in the British Museum back in 1973. Boy, what a thrill. I guess before that, the, the earliest one they had was the 6th century Codex Alexandrinus, uh, which is a major 
source uh, for textual criticism too, but these are you know, much older. Okay, uh, on a different note, Donovan says, um, Fitzgerald talks early on uh, on the subject of the writings of contemporary historians and notice, notes that many of the surviving histories seem to have gaps in them around the time that Jesus supposedly walked the earth. He postulated that Christian scholars, irate that there was an evidence of Christ, were the ones responsible for that. Uh, what are your thoughts on the matter? You mean that uh, Christian scholars censored stuff about Jesus they didn't like? Uh, that's possible. We we I, we don't have uh, sufficient textual manuscript evidence for most ancient works um, to to be able to compare, because of course um, there weren't as many people interested in preserving them as there were with a religion's scriptures. Right? You needed loads of copies of that. Uh, it's just luck that we have some of the major great Greek plays and so on, and the same with these histories. So I don't know, but if that has to remain speculative unless there is some reason to, to textually to to uh, to think so. Um, now, something like that certainly did happen with the Talmud. Uh, there are uh, sections that are just uh, what do they say uh, redacted out. I mean blotted out with ink, uh, and, and it seems like they uh, self-censored these things lest Christian authorities get a hold of them and persecute them. Uh, so that could well have happened. Uh, like there was a third century Acts of Pilate that was uh, circulated by pagans, and it uh, made Jesus look like a crook or villain or something. Uh, we don't have copies of it anymore, though we have a Christian Acts of Pilate, also called the Gospel of Nicodemus, and you really do have to wonder there if uh, that's not a result of Christian censorship. Uh, it's just the kind of thing they would have found embarrassing, and that doesn't mean it was true, right? Uh, who knows? But they found it insulting and uh, got rid of it. Uh, well, that's going to be it for today, but I think we had a pretty good session, and I hope to be with you uh, again soon. So thank you so much for your help and support with the Bible Geek. And remember, save your milk money for that Tillich book and my other one, uh, Blaming Jesus for Jehovah. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>